Hi, this is Val Hart, the real Dr. Doolittle, and today I'm talking with Dr. Franklin McMillan. Dr. Frank has been the Director of Wellbeing Studies at Best Friends Animal Sanctuary since October 2007. As Director of Wellbeing Studies, Dr. Frank assesses and studies the mental health and emotional well-being of animals who have endured hardship, adversity, and psychological trauma. Through his studies, he hopes to learn what the actual effects of trauma are, the psychological injuries and scars, and how to best treat them in order to restore to these animals a life of enjoyment rather than one of fear and ongoing emotional distress. His studies looking at the psychological health and behavior of the breeding dogs rescued from puppy mills and of dogs purchased from pet stores is landmark. It's land-breaking. Currently, he's studying cats from an institutionalized hoarding situation like the Great Kitty Rescue, the psychological causes and effects of abuse in dogs, the emotional rehabilitation and recovery of the fighting dogs taken from the estate of former NFL quarterback Michael Vick, and he's measuring personality and the quality of life in cats. Before coming to Best Friends, Dr. Frank was in private practice in Los Angeles for 23 years, and in addition, he was a clinical professor of medicine at the Western University of Health Sciences College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Frank is the author of Mental Health and Well-Being in Animals, the first textbook on the mental health of animals, and he's also written a book for the general public titled Unlocking the Animal Mind, How Your Pet's Feelings Hold the Key to His Health and Happiness. Welcome to the Dr. Doolittle Show, Dr. Frank. We're so glad you're here. Oh, thanks, Val, for having me. I'm delighted. I, you know, before we jump into your study on puppy mills, let's tell our listeners a little bit more about the Best Friends Animal Society. Sure. Let, uh, yeah, uh, let, let's just be really clear with them what y'all are and about the amazing work that y'all do. Okay. Um, well, the, the, the sanctuary uh, that we operate uh, was set up in 1986 um, by uh, what we uh, call affectionately our founders, uh, and many of them are still here. And what happened is they set up a sanctuary where animals could come that were unwanted or couldn't find homes anywhere else. And uh, from that, it was built up over the years to a pretty big place. We now house somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000 animals, depending on the day. Wow. Um, we used to look at it as a sanctuary that was basically a sort of the end of uh, home for all of the animals, but we've changed that to where we really actually now consider all of our animals adoptable. That's just that with the special needs, they need very special homes. Um, but if they can't find homes, then, of course, we offer them uh, the, a sanctuary life for the rest of their life here and give them all the love and attention that we can. And so we have um, uh, mainly dogs and cats, about six to 700 of each of them, and then lots of rabbits, but we also have uh, horses and pigs and goats and sheep and uh, quite uh, quite an array of animals. Oh, and lots of birds. I don't know why I always keep forgetting to mention them, but <laughs> lots of birds, uh, especially parrots, um, and as I'm sure all your audience knows, they're pretty long-lived. They can actually live 70, even 80 years. Uh, um, wow. So unfortunately, they they almost always outlive their owners, and therefore they have to find homes after that. That. But um, anyway, so we try to find homes for our animals, and we uh, uh, we take in animals that have been through uh, all kinds of hardships, abuse, or natural disasters, or uh, you know any number of things, um, and uh, and that's about it. We just um, we just take care of them here. Oh, and also it's important to know that we welcome visitors and volunteers in fact we uh, depend on them because they help us care for the animals by taking dogs and even cats on walks and socializing and that kind of a thing so uh if people haven't come here uh first of course go to our website at bestfriends.org check us out um but then if you can come by and visit uh or volunteer uh, uh please do we'd love to have you well and let's tell people where y'all are located you're in Kanab, utah <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I always laugh because we're in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah, we're on you. the southern border of Utah, just above uh, Arizona, in a tiny town called Kanab. I, uh, I moved here from L.A., which was, you know, what, several million, <laughs> and, and we're in a town of 4,000 here. Um, but it's beautiful. It, <clears throat> it's like living in a national park, and in fact, we're positioned right in between uh, Zion, Bryce, and uh, Grand Canyon, all national parks, and it's just an incredible country to be uh, in and live in, um, but it, yeah, it's the southern border, and you kind of have to get at it in a roundabout way, but um, uh, MapQuest or Google Maps can certainly guide anybody here. Wow. Yeah, oh, what I like about that, I'm I'm just imagining, you know, people planning their vacations, you know, what a wonderful area to visit, and if they got to come and volunteer and see your operation and, you know, offer some animals some love um, and support and, you know, they might even go home with one, but I guess I should. Well, yeah, and we always hope for that. The, uh, <laughs> you know, and a lot of people do use uh, a volunteer uh, time here as their vacation. Um, they can do it completely as their vacation, or as you just suggested, they can uh, ba- basically vacation and visit the area, yeah. but also maybe devote a few days uh, to helping us out. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that anybody's ever left here unsatisfied with the experience, and a lot of people come back every single year and we love having them i love that I, that just makes so much sense to me for an animal lover and a nature lover i mean it doesn't get much better than that sometimes does it <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's the name of it um yep. so it's y'all are a non-profit organization you build no kill programs and partnerships and you're working toward a day where there are no more homeless pets that's it. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing up all our mission statements there. Um, yeah, that's what uh, our main goal is: is to um, is to stop the killing in shelters. Um, and that's not a judgment on the shelters; they're really stuck with finances and space and that kind of a thing. But we consider, um, of course, the alternative of finding homes for all the homeless animals far superior for very obvious reasons. And uh, yeah, that's what we're uh, sh- certainly shooting for. I, I appreciate that so much. I really you know, want to support y'all in your efforts, and, of course, that's partly why I wanted to interview you, to bring mm-hmm. your message to more people. Um, yep. And, you know, and also, you know, I've done some fundraising for you guys, so I want Boom. to do a lot Thank more you. of that and uh, yeah. get you the support that you need. So um, I'm, just, I'm delighted to partner up with you. Um, I also wanted to ask you, before we jump into the puppy mills, um, what brought you into this work? What was it that made you decide you wanted to do this? Well, the this is pretty broad. Um, it's kind of funny that as as going into uh, the veterinary, uh, 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 the entire community of animal care and being a veterinarian, it that dates back so far that I can't even remember ever making the decision. It goes mm-hmm. back to where you call it a calling, I guess. Um, and I always wanted to. I remember setting up with my mom uh, a plan when I was teeny weeny that I'd be a vet and she'd open a pet store next to me and um, although that didn't happen I did go on and become a vet but then when I was in practice I found that um, a lot of things that were uh, affecting uh, uh, tremendously affecting the animals uh, both in terms of their enjoyment of life and their physical health was their emotional status and of course we know that in people how important that is now but nobody was paying attention in the animal community uh... so i decided to do a lot of work myself nothing bad nothing ugly in in the sense of studies but what i did is i started reading all the literature that had been written about some of these ugly studies that where they induce emotional problems and all that in animals uh... and 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 at least those animals that had to suffer can at least now benefit us from the standpoint of uh, of knowledge but there's a lot now known about how the uh, emotional well-being of the animals just affects their entire life uh... both of course just in happiness level but also like i said in physical health or or healing from physical injuries or diseases and that kind of a thing so i started to to delve more and more into that and and, and use it a lot in my practice uh... helping the animals um, and then I just started uh, writing a lot of the information into um, uh, articles for our medical journals and, of course, expanding into books and things like that. And, and then uh, I 
basically give talks on this kind of thing, quality of life and, and emotional well-being uh, in animals. And that expanded uh, to where I was doing a lot of that. And then, of course, um, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, and there was a call for vets to go out and help out. So I went out. And Best Friends was uh, operating a shelter out there at the time, and so I met them, and uh, we hit it off together, and they offered me a job here, and I said, well, geez, you know, there's nothing better to utilize my particular interest than to help animals that have been through these hardships. Uh, so I came here, and that's been four years now. Um, and then, as your intro said, um, I've focused on uh, studying uh, the animals that have been through the hardship. And again, none of these studies are the bad kind. They are the kind that do where we take in animals that have been through these problems and help them heal, but study the process as they're healing as to what works, what doesn't, what can help them better, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're doing this work. This is oh, near and dear to my heart. I, let me talk, or I would like you to talk actually a little bit about your book because this kind of leads us right into that. Unlocking the Animal Mind, How mm -hmm. Your Pet's Feelings Hold the Key to His Health and Happiness. Can you give yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the bottom line is that feelings are everything. Um, what uh, And this, by the way, applies to us, too. The, the Everything in life is pretty much guided by your feelings. And your feelings are what tell you that you need something, whether it be food or mental stimulation or, or companionship. These feelings that, that nature instilled in us trigger us to know, okay, i got to tend to this uh, and, and make my life, of course, happy by doing it. And then, of course, the good feelings are the things that make your life, obviously, even better than just satisfactory. They make them very beneficial. And what I did is I put all these concepts together in the book in terms of how feelings contribute for overall quality of life and enjoyment of life and that kind of thing. But I also, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, took the fact that feelings will affect physical health and showed that feelings guide everything. They guide your emotional well-being and how you view life as positive, negative, enjoyable, not enjoyable. Uh, but also, the whole time, they're affecting your physical well-being too. And so by tending to feelings, you're basically giving the animal everything that they want from us as their caregivers um, in terms of taking away the bad stuff, giving them the good stuff, and giving them all the tools to feel good and really just, you know, thrive in life rather than just exist or, you know, make do. So um, feelings really are everything, and uh, and once we all understand that, um, I mean, it, it, it's almost it's almost like by whenever I say that. I feel like, well, duh, everybody knows that. But it's far, far beyond what you ever thought in terms of how deeply uh, all the feelings are affecting everything in our and our pets' lives. Well, I like that you said that because it seems like a no-brainer when you say that. But the truth is that most of us, are, and I think a lot of our animals too, we're just kind of surviving or making do. We're not, yep. We haven't found the secret to thriving. You know, it's not really about our external circumstances or, you know, what happened to us and all that. It, it's how to take what's happened to us and all of that and how to thrive with it. Yeah. You know, and, and then to offer that gift to our animals. Tell us a story. I'm, I'm, I'm in the mood for a story. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me give me something to go on there. Uh, okay, so tell us a story about an animal or or, or you know, that was just like surviving, and now they're thriving. What what happened? What kind of work did did the working with their emotions or their feelings do? How how did that? Well, happen? here's here's one um, that it sounds gruesome, but but it it's got a good outcome. Okay. Um, we had a dog that came here uh, to us after being abused and the abuse was literally five bullets in the head um, and uh, when he came here um, he was of course uh, 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 not feeling well emotionally you can understand that I mean it's just yeah. a horrible situation I think I'm um, not feeling so well right now <laughs> I know I know well I, I, okay, I'm, beyond the, I'm beyond the bad part um, uh, in any uh. case so he came here and he was very unhappy in terms of, of anybody working with him he was snappy and, and snarly for obvious reasons, yeah. but 
really it's not even that long of a story because in giving him all, all the things that we, that we felt he wanted which was companionship but in a very controlled and 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 positive way non-threatening um he was uh, just very slowly uh letting his guard down over time uh to where now he appreciates the companionship that he was so frightened of before mm-hmm. and of course that's the whole goal in emotional healing is to take the unpleasant emotions that are that are basically driving so many animals when they come here and and you mentioned the by uh, the Michael Vick dogs uh, so many of the, uh, the, so many so many of the Michael Vick dogs uh, came here just terrified of human contact, and they followed the same path as the one I just mentioned in the fact that when we start to work with them and give them confidence that humans are not threatening, but in fact they're the they're the people that bring the good things to life, then basically you you slowly eliminate the negative emotions, slowly build the positive. And then they have trust in humans again uh, and can enjoy life because now they can interact with humans, which, as I'm sure you and your audience knows, uh, dogs uh, have evolved with domestication to be very bonded with humans. And, of course, that's where they get most of the benefits of life is the companionship uh, that they are genetically now geared towards getting and receiving and enjoying. And when they don't get it, when they when they can't trust human beings, they're deprived of one of the biggest things that their life is geared towards, and so it's really a struggle for them. In fact, we see, by the way, a lot of conflict when dogs uh, uh, and even cats come here to where they want the human companionship, but if you make any moves toward them, they scurry away because they're afraid, and uh, and it's terrible to watch this because you know they're they're struggling to get it, but their mind isn't ready to accept it, and so they're torn. I want it, but I don't want it, and uh, and over time, of course, many, uh, I should say the large majority, will eventually be able to overcome that, but some are so scarred psychologically that they really struggle with that and and it's a horrible thing to watch because you know that they're just so torn and by the way I should point out this is very similar to abused children because the children then are seeking the companionship and love of their parents but they come to fear their parents because their parents are the ones that are causing the abuse so it's it's the same kind of inner conflict that we try to get them over right right yeah I, I know in my work uh, you know, this, this is the kind of thing I also work with, you know, it, the emotional and mental well-being to help them reframe what happened to them, to leave it in the past, to, you know, to be fully present, um, you know, to shift to those emotions and their ability to reconnect, you know, mm-hmm. not just with their own yep. inner beingness, their own brilliance, you know, their own who they who they are designed and came here to be and their purpose and all of that, but also be able to connect with others in a mm-hmm. healthy way, in a in a happy way, in a respectful and appreciative way. So I yep. love what you're doing. Uh, so you've studied a lot with dogs, and I know you're working with cats, so I can't wait to hear about mm-hmm. that one too. <laughs> now, but let's go ahead and talk about your study on dogs and puppy meals. Yeah. Um, we, when I first came to Best Friends, um, very little was known about the dogs when they come from puppy mills. And, and let me back up for the obvious point of describing a puppy mill. Uh, puppy mills are the large breeding facilities where anywhere from dozens to thousands of puppies are churned out by keeping the parent dogs in cages, just turning out puppy after puppy. And basically, it's the same as an egg farm, meaning that when they keep hens in cages and the eggs come out repeatedly and the eggs go off to market, it's exactly the same in these large-scale breeding facilities that we call puppy mills where the parent dogs are kept in these cages. They just keep churning out the puppies and the puppies go off to market through pet stores 
and the parents never get out, um, and, or, or I should say they rarely get out, and that's the key is that sometimes they do get out because the puppy mill, for example, is closed down for legal reasons or the person running them decides, okay, I'm, I'm retiring, getting out of business or whatever. But sometimes the dogs are able to get out of this bad existence, and we noticed that they were showing problems. They were showing behavioral issues uh, and emotional and psychological issues. So when I came here to Best Friends, <clears throat> the first project I undertook was let's take a look at what's happening to these dogs and we can obviously do two things with that one is we can work to correct the situation that's causing the problem but also we can develop the best ways to help these animals get over their emotional struggles when they're coming out of these facilities so what we did, and the we here is two professor uh, colleagues of mine at the University of Pennsylvania Vet School, um, we collaborated to uh, solicit people who had adopted these adult breeding dogs that had gotten out of the puppy mills. And, I, and, and also let me clarify, there's two populations of dogs related to puppy mills. There are the adult dogs that are kept in cages to breed. Those are the ones I'm talking about right now. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the puppies that go off and are sold through pet stores. And that actually, that, that group of dogs is a subject of a study that we just completed and is now being reviewed by a, uh, a medical journal. The other one, though, that we did complete and is, in, and, and is published is the one on the adult dogs. But Anyway, so the, we decided to look at the adopters of these adult dogs, uh, or not look at them, but have them fill out a very lengthy psychological profile of their dogs, and then we obviously compared that group of dogs to normal dogs, and a normal, of course, means ones that never lived in a puppy mill, just normal pet dogs. And we were able then to see what are the psychological uh, effects and the psychological scars that the dogs come out of the puppy mills with, and that's what the study showed, is that there's an extensive array of problems that they develop, and uh, we were also able to de determine that these problems uh, can last for years, sometimes a lifetime, but we were also, on the good side, able to show that a lot of these dogs are able to overcome these problems, and most importantly, and this is important for your audience, is that we found that when we actually looked into the people and their satisfaction of having adopted these dogs with such difficult problems, we we found the satisfaction level overwhelmingly high. Um, for example, I asked people, how satisfied are you for having adopted this dog? 92% said extremely satisfied, mm -hmm. and only 1% said not satisfied. Wow. And so what we learned is that although these dogs, just like uh, children who have been abused or abandoned uh, or uh, gone through the foster system, uh, that present challenges to the adopters, the rewards of having gone through it and helped these animals overcome it are overwhelming. And so what I'm saying here is that it's certainly not for everybody to adopt these dogs, but for the people that have it in their heart to do it and work with them, the the reward they get is so incredible. It brings tears to your eyes when they describe how much they love their dogs, even with all their problems. Oh. Mm, it brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So I know y'all, you had, um, it says a total of 1,169 former puppy male dogs. Right. And, wow. uh, and we had actually more enter the study, but we had to uh, eliminate a few because they just, people weren't sure enough that they'd come from puppy mills. So we actually got quite a, a response to our solicitation. Um, but what we found uh, is that most, of the, the emotion that drives most of the dogs is just blatant fear. And the fear we actually were able to break down as fear of unfamiliar people, like when these dogs are adopted into a household and you have a friend come over to visit, the fear of that adopted dog towards that friend that walked in can be very, very intense and they'll run and hide. If they also show fear towards just objects and sounds uh, unrelated to people, but just uh, like cars driving by, that kind of a thing. Um, and what's especially interesting is that they actually show more fear towards other dogs 
than typical dogs do. And the reason that's so interesting is that puppy mill dogs are almost always housed in groups. So you tend to think, well, if any dog is socialized to other dogs, it's puppy mill dogs. But what appears to be happening is that unlike your household where you might have three dogs and then if there's any conflict, one dog can run off and hide in another room, these dogs can never get away from one another. So if there's conflict, either they're involved with the conflict like a fight or there's two other dogs in your cage and they're fighting and you're now uh, stressed out from that, you can't get away. And and like I tell people a lot, if I were to lock 10 humans in a room for two years and come back and let them out, they'd be pretty ticked off too, you know. Um, and so uh, the, the key about socialization is that you have to be able to get away from conflict, and these dogs just never can. So they come out actually more a fair fearful of other dogs than typical dogs are. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. Uh, you know, I know there's a comment here about um, some of these dogs seem to be, like, autistic. Or yeah, we like found that. that that when people, uh, a lot of the, well, let me say that the profile itself was a multiple choice profile. All the questions were based on severity of any particular sign. But we allowed people to write comments for the, uh, at the end of the, the, of the questions. And the one description that seemed to show up, uh, almost, not most often, fear was the most often comment, but, mm -hmm. um, but the one description was that people were saying, if my dog was a human, I would say he was autistic, or he behaves just like my autistic daughter. Um, and so uh, that particular word kept coming back. And the reason that that seems to be so uh, apparent is that these a lot of these dogs will adopt this vacant stare where they'll just stare into space and, and, and seem like zoned out, spaced out. People had a lot of descriptions for that. But somehow mentally disconnected, and it's not luckily it's not a constant thing, but it's like the dog in the middle of the day would just take an hour where they were like just zoned out um and uh, and so people would equate it to basically uh an autistic child who wasn't mentally connecting with what was going on around them mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm. wow so what happens uh, how do I want to ask this what would you advise to someone who is considering taking one of these dogs or are they now realizing oh my god my dog is a puppy mill dog now now I understand you know some of the issues I've been struggling with what what hope can you offer as far as what to do or how to work with these dogs what what do y'all actually do with them well, the, the, uh, that was part of actually a follow-up questionnaire where we actually asked people, of all the things you've tried, what worked best, what worked least, what yeah. caused more problems, that kind of a thing. And what we found, it was very interesting, um, uh, if I back up and tell you that originally we thought when, you, when these dogs are able to get out of puppy mills, we thought the best thing for them would be a quiet household with no other dogs and just as quiet as can be. And we found out pretty quickly that's the worst thing. What actually is the best thing is to be in a household where there's one or more other dogs that are, of course, friendly dogs. But what would allow that to ha or what would happen then is it would allow the puppy mill rescued dog to model their behavior after the other dogs, which they've never been around. They've never been around normal dogs. And so they could model their behavior. But also they could see how the, uh, the pet dogs were interacting with humans and they could see over and over that that these other dogs showed no fear of humans, and so they would pick up on that and say, well, geez, I, I shouldn't be afraid either. Mm -hmm. And so there was a tremendous uh, benefit with being with other dogs to model behavior, to be comforted, uh, and, to, and, and they would improve much faster when they had these other dogs around. So that was the single most valuable thing to help these dogs overcome what they were trying to overcome. Uh, all the other things, uh, there's quite a list of things that would help dogs. Um, but what we found quite interesting is that a lot of the things that people would describe as the most effective uh, uh, help for their dog 
a lot of other people would list that as the least effective. And I'll, I'll give you an example. One thing that we found in these dogs um, is that a lot of them are very sensitive to being touched. They either don't want to be touched or they don't want to be picked up or held or hugged. And, of course, we have the, the sense that all dogs just want to be loved, and so we want to hug them. But some of these dogs have never had that happen, and so they're terrified. And so a lot of people said that hugging was the worst thing that they tried to do, but then other people told us that it was the most effective thing that they did, and so we found what actually is kind of obvious, and that is all of these dogs are very individual, and it's just like people going through something traumatic. Uh, you cannot take one technique and apply it to all the people because it just doesn't work, and so we found the same thing uh, dramatically in these dogs that some things work, some don't, some actually cause your dog cause one dog to worsen and the other dog to get better. And so with all this information, we're now able to give people informa a lot of help and also to quickly identify things that may work, but if you see that it's not working, a bail out on that and try something else and it, it gives people the chance to move along to new things rather than to keep uh, trying things that are going to fail. Yeah, yeah. I I, just a quick comment, you know, in, when I work with animals, too, I've found the same thing. One technique, every technique will work with at least one animal, but it won't work with all animals. Right. And we have yep. to understand the individual. We have to know what feels good to them and what does not. We need to understand what they're thinking and what makes sense to them and what they most want, you know, what they yep. need. And like you said, some some animals love to be touched, and they need it, and they crave it, and others' touch is scary, and it does not feel good. They tense, you know, they, they have the opposite reaction. So I'm really right. glad you brought that point out. Very yeah. important to, to know. They are individuals. They think and behave and feel individually, not as a, as a whole. So that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's talk about your study with cats. Do you think that it, is it similar to what you found with dogs? Or well, have, well, no, because because the, uh, what we looked at with cats was a different group of cats. We ah. looked at cats that had been through what's called a hoarding situation. And ah. for anybody who doesn't know, if that's where a large number of animals are amassed in a household or a property uh, well beyond the person's ability to give them proper care. And uh, luckily, I guess, although it's used for entertainment, luckily these TV shows on hoarding have enlightened people to these situations. And, you know, unlike the old days where we used to think it was the crazy cat lady, um, hmm. there's nothing funny or cute about these situations. These animals are often starving or getting into horrible, horrible diseases and not being treated. Um, it's, it's just, I mean, it's horrible. In fact, over half of the hoarding cases have dead animals when the authorities arrive. That's how bad it is. Um, so what we did is we had we were called in to help with a rescue in the, uh, a desert area in Nevada, a, a small town called Pahrump, and there was a hoarding situation there where a lady was uh, was uh, portraying herself as a rescue sanctuary, and sadly a lot of people thought that she was and took their cats to her, mm -hmm. but it ended up being about 900 cats being cooped up in this desert uh, uh, property that had a big fence around it um and it was as people know in in nevada the 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 heat in the summer is just brutal mm -hmm. and these poor cats were uh were uh, starving for not just uh food but what we found is that when we would walk into the compound you would be like a cat magnet and the mm -hmm. cats would be all over you because they were starving for human affection too mm -hmm. um and 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 just like we talked about <clears throat> There's a big difference from cat to cat. So a lot of them were starving for human affection. A lot, a lot of the other ones were terrified of humans. And so we saw all types there. But 
what we did then is we, uh, of course, rescued all the animals and, and adopted them out. And I contacted the people who had adopted these uh, cats and asked if they'd uh, uh, give us, you know, uh, uh, or fill out a questionnaire on their cats. And then we combined uh, all that and compared it with a group of normal control cats, which were just standard pet cats, and, uh, and, and looked at the difference. And what we found is that it wasn't actually terribly different, um, but the one thing that stood out, it showed that of all the tests where people would, for example, put the cat on their lap or put the cat on the floor, that the cats that came from the hoarding situation actually were more affectionate towards people, meaning they would jump on their lap faster uh, or at a higher rate. Um, and what this seems to, to to parallel is a study that was done in Great Britain uh, where uh, it, do, it doesn't happen this way anymore, but when animals would be shipped to Great Britain when people would move, uh, because of the rabies concern, they would require all animals to be quarantined for six months before the people could take them out into their homes. And so a group of scientists looked at what psychologically happens to these cats that are quarantined, and what they found found is the cats, when they go through three and six months of quarantine, actually come out more affectionate than they were before. And what appears to be happening is that when you go through a life or, or a period of life without the human uh, companionship, you actually then uh, come out, uh, I guess, however you want to look at it, more appreciative, more wanting, more needing the security of knowing that the human isn't going to leave you. And so these cats, we found, show the same thing. And, and it, it seems to suggest that they are less secure after going through the hoarding situation and need the constant close proximity of people, which then translates into looking to be affectionate because they want to be on your lap all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting thing, um, but clearly shows that they do go through changes. Um, oh, and, and the other very important thing I should point out, my focus is on their psychological health, but the physical health uh, was a very big suffering issue. And in fact, uh, a year after adoption, these uh, uh, the cats that come from the hoarding situation in Nevada, they about 50% of them are still battling uh, physical illnesses, whereas uh, in the control group, it's only like 16%. That's just your average pet cat population. So wow. the physical health and the psychological health both go through quite a bit, and our studies now are expanding into looking at hoarded dogs and, and different kinds of hoarded cats, ones that are cooped up in households, not so much running in a desert uh, compound. So um, we're looking at basically all these different things that might affect and harm these animals. Mm. That makes a lot of sense to me. I, yeah, I'm ha I have to laugh. I, I have a lot of people come to me. Why, why doesn't my cat like to sit on my lap? I want a lap cat. <laughs> <laughs> so I could, I could just hear some listeners going, hmm, giving a little idea there. Oh, I, I have an idea now. How to make my yeah, cat? Know. You know, because some cats, they don't want to be, they don't like that. They, you know, most of them, or a lot of them, they're like. No, I know. It's funny you say that because, of course, it's <laughs> not actually funny, but I've had people say, Maybe I, uh, you know, ought to turn my cat over to a hoarder for a while and, and get him back. But, <laughs> but needless more, to say, yeah. that just makes them less secure. Not, not yeah. like they're just feeling better and more affectionate. They right. now need you more because they're worried about you abandoning them. Right, and there, it's not a happy thing. It's uh, right. a right. fearful, uh, insecure you know, thing. Insecure, right. you know, lack of confidence. Um, you know, and then we've got a Velcro cat. You know that. Uh -huh. Isn't happy unless you are sitting down with him uh, safely, you know, keeping you there, um, you know. So, I had a cat, by the way. I had a cat that would that would, as I'm bending my legs to sit down, he'd be on my lap before my butt actually hit the uh, <laughs> the seat. I and mean, that's how I mean that's how eager he was to be in my lap. It, mm. it would I wouldn't even be down yet, and he's on my lap. Um, <laughs> it it was kind of funny. It's funny. Ah, uh, all right, so. What would you say to someone who might be considering getting a dog from a pet store or online? 
Yeah, uh, that, we have a lot to say about that. Oh, um, okay. The, the, <laughs> well, just one word, don't. No. Um, <laughs> the uh, the pet store dogs, um, you know, they're they're all worthy of love. I I don't want to in any way suggest that they should be ignored. And and this is a difficult thing because a lot of people feel okay. I want to rescue that pet store dog that's been yes. there and not selling. And 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 we don't want to tell people okay. Don't rescue dogs, but of course the problem is is that as soon as you hand money over to the pet store for the dog, that money goes back to the person who is keeping dogs in cages and and basically with the message, good job, keep it up, replace the one I just bought. Right. Yeah, right. And so uh, the thing about pet store dogs is that the only way to stop these puppy mills from the harm they're causing the dogs in cages is to not buy from pet stores. And the dogs that are in pet stores, they'll eventually find homes in the sense that the, that the people that have them will drop the prices and eventually they'll go out. But but by dropping the prices, of course, they lose the profit margin and ultimately then they can't keep up that kind of business. But but anyway, so buying from pet store, uh, you shouldn't. You should get from – first of all, we recommend, of course, a shelter. If you're looking for a purebred, uh, first try a shelter because there's lots of purebreds in shelters. But then there's also rescue groups for every breed, and you can find them either in the phone book online or by uh, contacting the AKC itself uh, at their headquarters. And uh, and so you can get a breed rescue group for every breed you're looking for. And then thirdly, um, you can go to the small private breeders. And the way to tell a small private breeder from a puppy mill is that the small private breeder will want you to come to their property to see what's going on. And they will interview you because they want to make sure their puppy is going to a good place. They'll also want your guarantee that you will return that puppy to them if it doesn't work out. And of course, no big scale breeder, puppy mill, pet store is going to be making those kinds of demands because they kind of want your money and nothing else. Um, So that's the way. Now, the internet is a little tricky because a lot of puppy mill people have decided, okay, I, I can trick people by making this beautiful internet site that makes it look like my dogs romp through, you know, meadows and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, the point is, is that there are good breeders that operate through the internet, but the way to tell the difference is that the good breeder will want you to come and visit. They will want to interview you, whereas the other ones will just simply want your address so they can ship the dog via air freight to you, and that's what you don't want to buy is something that's shipped to you because that's almost a guaranteed puppy mill situation. Mm, wow. That's important. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Frank, for all of your work, for your sure. love and care for animals, for the studies that you've put so much into. Um, I'm really grateful for what y'all are well, doing. Thanks for letting us share the word on your program. Yeah, you're welcome. So let's again give everybody your uh, Best Friends Animal Society website. That is it, bestfriends.org, right. right? That's it. One word, bestfriends.org. Um, and they can get all kinds of information. Uh, if people want to contact me directly, my email address is dr.frank, that's dr.frank, F-R-A-N-K, at bestfriends.org. So if anybody has any questions about what we talked about, uh, they can feel free to contact me. Wonderful. Thanks so much for giving us that. Sure. Oh, well, I've got a lot to think about, and I love having learned all of this, and I think we've probably taken up enough of your time today. <laughs> well, <I'm laughs> so happy to I have a feeling it. animals are clamoring for your – if you're not sitting down and have cats on your lap now, I'm sure that there, there are those looking for you. So. Yep. Oh, thank you. Okay. You're all welcome. Right. All right. Okay. Well, we will catch up again. Thanks. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. For more information or to listen to other podcasts, go to valhart.com forward slash blog. And if you're someone who values a non-invasive, holistic solution to resolving problems with your dogs, cats, and horses, and you want better behaved, healthier, and happier animals, just go to my website at valhart.com to apply for a complimentary happy animal assessment session. And be sure and remember to look for my CDs on iTunes. Learning how to talk with animals is fun and will change your life.
So while you're there at my site, get my free Quick Start Animal Talk course and check out the world's first complete animal communication made easy system. May the love of animals bless you, teach you, inspire you, heal you, and reconnect you to the circle of life.